On this episode, we finally sit down with one of Thailand's most followed online voices, Richard Barrow. So if you've ever wanted to get to know the man behind the tweets, you'll love this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawadee krap, and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 but can't return to Canada for Christmas because I left all my winter clothes there and they don't make them in my size here. That is a dilemma, no doubt. Yeah. And I'm Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 22 years ago, fell in love with the Tom Yum Goong flavored potato chips, so I never left. Man, those Lay's potato flavor scientists are just mad. Mad scientists are flavor Dude, you are, you, you are a localization lover. You, you, you probably remember this, but in general, I'm not into like the local, the local variants. But you oh, are, really? right? You like the local variants. To, to a degree. But you know what I found? I was really excited about the other day. I went to the new mall across from Siam Paragon. It's called ICS or CSR or something like okay. that. Okay. And um, they have a, they have a uh, Moss Burger inside there. Oh, right, I, sure. I, I haven't had a Moss Burger in a long time. And I'm, I was with my son and I said, oh, Moss Burger. And he said, oh, I haven't tried those. Let me, let's try them. So I went, we went to the Moss Burger and I noticed they had the burger with, they don't, the, the, the bun of the burger is not bread. It's sticky rice. Oh, I have seen those. I've actually never had one, but I've seen those. So did you, did you try it or not? No, no, no. I was really craving a traditional hamburger, but those are awesome. That that localized version of a hamburger with a sticky rice bun is so good. It's a good idea. It's a very good yeah. idea. Yeah. So I'm a lover of localization. Cool. More power to you. <laughs> all right. We want to give a big thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get every episode a day early, behind the scenes photos of our interviews, a heads up to send questions to upcoming guests and access to our discord server to chat with me, Greg and other listeners around the world. But best of all, patrons also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and Bangkok topics. On this week's bonus show, we chatted about a tear-filled visit to the dentist that Greg's son experienced and the subsequent visit to an escape room as a reward for being so brave, the unseasonal rain that shut down Bangkok on a Wednesday morning, and the unfortunate position that we find ourselves in as hosts of the Bangkok podcast, but drawing nothing but blanks when people ask us where to find the best place to party or hippest new restaurant. <laughs> to learn how to become a patron, click the support button at the top of our website. Getting old is not, not for the faint of heart. I got nothing, man. I got nothing. <laughs> right. And as always, if you have a comment, a show idea, or just want to say hi, head to thebankopodcast.com and click the little microphone button on the bottom right to leave us a voicemail that we will play on the show. All right, well, this episode is a fairly special one in that it has literally been 13 years in the making. On the podcast, I say 10, but it's actually 13. Wow. Well, anyway, back in 2010, when Tony and I first started the Bangkok podcast, we wanted to have a young up-and-comer named Richard Barrow on the show who was making a name for himself on this snazzy new platform called Twitter. But famously media shy, Richard declined and despite gently prodding him every once in a while in the ensuing years, he has always preferred to keep the focus on Twitter rather than himself. It's probably a good thing, worked out all right, considering he's now got over 200,000 followers and is often called a one-man TAT, who many people look to for news about Thailand. But for whatever reason, about a month ago, the stars aligned and or he got fed up with me asking, and he finally agreed to sit down and chat with us. So in an extra long episode that's part one of a two-part series, Richard tells us how he came to Thailand, why he settled in Samutprakan province, and how he got his start posting pics on social media. And actually, just a quick recording note, uh, for some reason, the recording cut off the first couple of minutes of our interview, but it picks up soon after that. So here is our conversation with our buddy, Richard Barrow. <laughs> Well, how did you end up in Thailand in the first place? Thailand wasn't the destination. So, I mean, I'll try and keep it brief, but I, I, like a lot of people from the UK, I went to Australia for a year. It was a working holiday. Uh, 
I didn't do the working bit, but I, I went for one year. <laughs> you went for, you did for the holiday part. <laughs> well, I have, uh, yes, precisely. I have a number of relations there. So I went there, bought a station wagon and did the whole circuit around Australia. And then I, so basically I took a year off work. So I was working in London, so backtrack a bit. So I was, uh, my, my, my career wise, I was working at that time for the BBC in the film editing department. So it was in film drama for, for the BBC. And I really enjoyed that. But at the same time, I kind of really interested in travel. I wanted to escape kind of thing. So I decided to take a year off. So that's when I went to Australia. And when I came back, it was like I was living outside of London and I had to do this commute to London every day, like hour and a half, two hours commute into London. And I, I just couldn't hack it anymore. And it was, it, was, it was very difficult. So the thing that kept me going was basically planning another trip. And I thought, okay, let's do one more trip and it'll get out of my system. Then I'll settle down and have 2.4 children and all that <laughs> and a mortgage and, and, and stuff like that. And so, yeah, so I planned this basically an overland trip from from the UK to Australia as much as I, I could. Wow. So basically it's gonna backpack across Asia instead of flying there, which I did the first time. The second time I was gonna backpack and go by train for much as much of the way, which is what I did. I, I bought the train ticket from London, you know, the Eurotunnel through uh then through uh, Europe and then Moscow did the Trans Siberian Express is like six, oh, wow. seven days into Beijing. Oh, that's and then cool. trains in Beijing. So it was like a month month or two months in Beijing and then a bus over the Karakoram Mountains into Pakistan and spent you know, three, four weeks there and then over the border into India. And this would have been late 80s or early 90s? 93, 90, around then, okay. 93. Mm. And then, yeah, in India and then ended up, well, I did like two months in India and then ended up in Calcutta and I couldn't get across to Thailand from there. So I flew from Calcutta to, to Bangkok. So my attention, I was staying everywhere else for like, one, two months. My intention was to stay in Thailand for one week because it had a kind of a bad reputation back then being like the, uh, um, you know, the, the sex industry. Sure. And I was also, I, when I was in Australia, there was that, what's it called? Uh, the Bangkok Hilton, Nicole Kidderman, I think. And it was, it was like, I was just so paranoid that the police were going to plant drugs. But well, the Bangkok Hilton being the, the prison. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but there was the TV series. That I think, I can't remember the, the details now, but... Uh, basically, uh, it's like I was so paranoid that the drugs were going to, uh, so the police were going to plant drugs in my pocket, and then right, I was right. going to end up in the Bangkok Hilton, which is the uh, the prison right, kind right. of thing. So I was kind of between that. It's like, oh, Thailand's not very attractive to me. I only knew like the bridge on the River Kwai thing, and I thought sure, oh, maybe yeah. I go check that out and stuff like that. But no, yeah, I was intending to stay one week. So, uh, so what happened was in in Thailand, uh, scouting is part of the uh, the curriculum. Okay, so my mother at that time was running scout commissioner courses in, in London and the owners of the, uh, the school where I work now, they went to London, Gilwall to do a scout commissioner's course. So they stayed in contact with my mother since then. So basically, they, this was a place for me to stop. They, they, they would uh, pick me up at the airport and just entertain me for the week and then I'll carry on. So it was just basically... Some people I would meet along the way. You had contacts basically here. Yeah, I had a contact. Yeah, hang out with mom's friends and yeah, yeah. kind of thing. So yeah, so they picked me up at the airport. I, I had no, no idea what to expect, and you know, I don't know your first impressions of of Bangkok, but it was like this is a modern city. You know, right, people right. not walking, uh, riding around on elephants or right, right, like right, that. right, right. And we they picked us picked me up at Dongmueng Airport, and we came down on the uh, elevated expressway, and it's like. Every single car was modern and, and brand new. And it's like, where, where's all the old bangers? Where's all yeah, the yeah. old cars like we have back home, you know? And there was nothing like that at all. And these big advertising billboards and stuff. And it was so like, this is, the, kind of, this is the early 90s. So this is the one of the Asian dragons. Like the, uh, yeah, the, it was the, doing good. The Thai economy was... Up yeah. to 1997. Right, right. So yeah, so they, they picked me up. They brought me to the school. And it was like, I didn't know what to expect. And it's a private run school. So they, the, the, the family live inside the school. They have uh, kind of, you know, like uh, housekeeping staff. So I had my own kind of housekeeper, shall we say, and she cleaned my bedroom every day. She washed my clothes every day. Not bad. And, you know, washed my, my towel and everything, my pajamas, everything, every single day. They, they insisted everything had to be washed every single day. Wow. And I arrived wearing uh, like shorts and T-shirt, as you can imagine. So, you know, the next day 
these these uh, long trousers and shirt magically magically appeared on right on on, on the bed kind of thing. So it was <laughs> their way funny. of saying that you need to dress a bit better than that. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I was going to stay there for like a week, and then I, I kind of enjoyed it, and I kind of liked the uh, the culture because it was nice staying with the family, and, and they they. I went to like family events, went to the local temple and there's like weddings and funerals and stuff like that. And, and then I kind of enjoyed teaching at the school because even though I'm not a teacher by profession, it was in the blood. So my mother was a teacher, my, both of my sisters are teachers and aunts and uncles. So. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's kind of in the blood. So I kind of enjoyed it. And I, 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 so I stayed, I think I stayed like three, four months and it was like, well, I, I really need to carry on to Australia now. I'm trying to get to Australia for, for Christmas to meet my relations there. So, so after like four months, I said, okay, look, I, I, I need to go <laughs> kind of thing. But they were making it so comfortable for me. It was making it difficult for me to leave. And then so I, 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 I then took the train down to the southern border and I took a boat across to uh, Sumatra. And then it was like um, Sumatra, Java, Bali. And then I flew from Bali to uh, Darwin. So I was trying to go as much as I can overland. And then by, I was there by Christmas at my relations and I got a phone call from, from Thailand and said, would you like to come back and you know, teach for a year? And I said, yeah, okay. I, I kind of running out of money. I was trying to go around the world kind of thing. Oh, I was wow. running out of money. I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go back for a year and, 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 and yeah, see, see how it goes. So after Christmas, uh, I got applied for the Nombi visa because we're going to do it properly. And I flew back to Thailand and... Basically, that was it. <laughs> the rest is history. <laughs> yes, that's right. I've been that's here right. ever since. So yeah, it was, and because the reason I'm still at the same school is because it's it's, it's a family run school, and that they treat me as as one of the family. So well, so, so it makes it difficult to leave because I'm sure. just so comfortable here now. <laughs> well, among other things, you have uh, excellent Thai language skills, and so did did that come straight away? Did you dig in, or was that slowly over time? Not. Not really, because uh, I was living inside the school for, for the first part. So they're all speaking English to me. But I actually made a point right at the beginning to learn how to read Thai. And I, I felt that was important because there's, there's different ways of each person, each book you use to learn uh, Thai, they use a different transliteration system, like the Benjamin Becker and all the others. They had a different right. way of doing it. Right. And yet it's like learning two languages at the same time. You had to learn Thai as well as their system of of, sure. of speaking that speaking the language, so I thought it actually makes sense to actually learn how to read Thai and, and then just read Thai and don't, don't look at the transliteration unless you actually need a lot of help. Exactly. So I actually made a big point right in the beginning to to learn how to read, and that that paid off. That because when you're walking around, it's like it's like a like a kind of a dictionary, and you're just reading stuff all all, all the time. So that that helped. But then after I moved out of the school, and that was kind of like thrown into the deep end and then I had to you start using Thai to survive and because I I wasn't living in Bangkok in Sukhumbi you know where all the foreigners are where all the local Thais would be speaking English I was living in the community here where there's no foreigners so I was forced to uh, speak Thai so yeah so then it just but then because I had that background for reading Thai it just became easier and, and this was in 1995 in Samut Prakan province. And that's where we're sitting right now. We're actually sitting in your school in Samut Prakan right now. In the computer lab. In the computer lab, yeah. surrounded by monitors. Um, so, I mean, even now, we just went up to the to the observation tower, which was very, very nice. And uh, even walking around just in this area, there was a couple of stairs from, from Thais. There's not a lot of foreigners here even now. So back then, it must have been super oh yeah when when walking around town is like everyone would be staring and it's like you're the only foreigner so it takes it took a while to get used to that kind of thing but i did get used to it some people can't do that they don't like to be the center of attention but i i, I just did it by just ignoring it and it wasn't a problem and, and just smile <laughs> right. to smile back but you had to be on your best behavior because you were just like the the farang so well, yeah, it's not just the Farang. It's not like I'm an ambassador for all Farangs. It's like <laughs> it's like I was representing the school as well. So anything ah. bad I did, and when I say bad, I, I, I don't mean bad, bad. I mean like jumping the queue. I mean it's like jumping the queue at Seven Eleven or, right, or, right. or or something minor like that will be seen as as bad or, right. or sitting. And word is going to get back. Yeah, know? word. Yeah, because it's a small <laughs> town. Even though it's a city, it's still a small <laughs> town. I mean, I went probably like 10, 15 miles away. And the next day they say, oh, I heard you went there. <laughs> it's like, so, hey, do you have, have you met our new teacher? Oh, you mean the guy that jumped in front of me in line at 7-Eleven, yeah, yeah. that guy? So, yeah, you have to be on your best behavior. So, I mean, it's, 
it, it's difficult, but it kind of it, it kind of changes you without you realizing it. And I mean, you almost become almost Thai like, even though it's not you're not Thai, and you will never be Thai. But I, I find that living living and working inside a school is like a, a, a like kind of a bubble. Like it's like everything is 100% Thai culture inside the school. Whereas when you go outside, everything's watered down, so you don't get all the uh, the culture like you do when inside the school. Interesting. So in, inside the school, if you if you hand a document to someone or receive a document, you you put your right hand out and your left hand is kind of supporting your your wrist. And there's a lot and and things like when you're walking past people, you have to dip your head and. There's all subtle things like that that's going on here 100% inside the school. But when you go outside, you don't see it as as much. And you came, you were young enough, and you obviously cared enough to just start mimicking that. So you, you picked yeah, you it do up. Yeah, you do it. You kind of, uh, I don't know, you, you, you fit in. You kind of, some people just fit in and naturally do it, and you go with the flow, and you don't try and... Uh, it's like you don't try and swim against the sure. the, the flow, which some people do. Mm. And you see on, on, on the forums, people complaining about this and that in Thailand. They're not going with the flow. They're, they're trying to fight it. They're trying. And then those kind of people, uh, quite often the Thais hate them because they're always saying things like, oh, back home we do it this way. And, and Thais hate it when you start a sentence with, oh, in, in America we do it this way or something right, like that. Right, yeah, of course. Because they're so proud that they're never being colonized and they, they, they feel like we're looking down on them and, if, if we start a, a, sure. a conversation like that. So and even then, though it might be constructive criticism, they don't take it that right, way. Right. So you always have to be careful and adapt. And then I say to all the new teachers when they come in, I say, look, just, just go with the flow. Uh, don't make waves and, and just pick your battles. You can't, there's a lot of things you can't change. It's the way it's, it is and it's the way yeah. it's always been. Just go with it. As, as our buddy Scott says, uh, you know, he said, he's just, said this one time at a Petra Kucha event, and I remembered it. He said, don't try to change Thailand. Let Thailand change you. Yeah, precisely. Yeah. And, and you don't realize it because it's over a period of years, and it's only when you go back home, and then you suddenly realize that, oh, actually, it's a culture shock to go back home because you become sure. so Thai-like. No, little things like you're on the uh, on, on the train or something. People got their feet up on on, on the seat opposite. Like, or, what are you or, doing? Or they're walking down the street and then they're walking very fast with with their head down and swinging the arms and things like that. You just don't do that. I, I've always said that in in Thailand, if you see uh, someone walking fast in the distance, that's not a Thai person. That's going to be a foreigner for sure. Uh, but Thais don't walk yeah. fast like that. That happened to me the other right. day. I saw yeah. a guy walking. I'm like, that dude's a foreigner. Yeah. He's not Thai. And, and there's a good reason for that. It's like, it's it's because it's hot, and and you definitely don't want to start your day by being hot and sweaty because then sure. that's it for the whole the whole day. And it's the same with uh, the the Jai Yen Yen thing, keeping a cool heart. Is is if if you don't get angry about things, then you're not going to get hot and sweaty. And and I oh. think it kind of interesting. It connects. Everything connects together, and that's why some people say, "Oh, oh well, why are ties are so." Blase! They're, they're they're not getting involved in things. They're not not fighting, and there's no road rage. Or and, I mean, there is now. It's it's kind of a different environment, a different culture and life compared to when I first came right, here. Yeah. But back back then, everything was very relaxed. My Ben Lai attitude. It's it's what I liked about Australia. The no worries thing in Australia. They uh, had that kind of th- that thing here. The My sure. Ben Lai thing. There's, there's no worries. No, don't don't no. No worries, mate. Don't, don't, don't. Yeah, precisely. And, and I like that kind of thing. And the other things I liked about Thailand, the reason I stayed was 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 the culture, the the religion, because it wasn't a religion; it was a way of life. Mm. Buddhism is a way of life rather than sure. a, uh, a religion. And and just the the cultural festivals and everything about it, and I, I kind of fell in love with that. But it's not the same Thailand now as it was then. So you do get the road rage now. You do get the angry ties now. You get people shooting each other now, which you didn't get necessarily before. But still not as much as back uh, home. Precisely. And that's the thing. And that's why I say to people when they get angry with Thailand, and they keep complaining about this and that. I say, you need to go back home and get a reality check. Right. Because <laughs> right. every time I go back home and then I, I see Thailand in another light, so well, it's actually quite nice in Thailand. <laughs> sure. I got to say, man, the, the more I read about, about things in North America, the way things are going in Canada and the U.S., like, it just every time I read a story, it just erodes my any desire I have to go back. I'm like, well, the I'm mass like, shootings in the US are just out there for that. of control. They're just out of control. But we, we in, in Thailand, we had that uh, the the nursery it wasn't a mass shooting, but it was it was a stabbing mass, as well as right. a shooting. So that that was that was shocking. And then before that, there was the uh, Terminal Twenty One in 
uh, where was it? In Nakamrachasim, I think. Yeah, in Korat. Yeah. Korat. Yeah, it was that. That that's for us. That's shocking because that's not like a, an everyday occurrence, right. and that's right. that's kind of that's the way things are changing, and we are going to catch up to America, I guess, at one point. Just hope Ugh. we don't, and it's going to be a slow way, but we'll. But we will be there eventually. Well, it says, it says that that's more of a comment on just like human humanity as a species more than anything. Yeah, right? yeah. So but I think that's partly our fault. It's like, it's the Western influence on the Thai culture. They were perfectly all right before we came along. Right, right, right. And, and, and people talk about Thais. There's different kinds of Thais. You've got the Thais at, at the uh, tourist destinations like in Bukit and Pattaya and Sukhumit Road. <laughs> and then you've got the ordinary Thais, which is the one I met and fell in love with because they're the ones right. where and had no interaction with foreigners before. And they're the genuine type. Those are the ones that sure. w- we need to promote because the ones, the Thais, quite, not always, obviously, <laughs> but the Thais that you meet in Pattaya are not, they're, they've been kind of spoiled or they've been well, changed by, by taint, money. Tainted? By know, money. Well, those are the only, taint, but it's money. Right. Money changes everything. So some of the harshest ties I've ever met have been at tourist places where you think they would have the customer skills, but a lot of them are, are burned out. They're, they're, they've been dealing with uh, asshole tourists. Precisely. So, yeah. so, so you get ties. Exactly are, that. They, they've the angriest been, ties I've ever seen. They've been, been influenced in a right. bad way from these foreigners who, are, right. who are quite often angry. And, right. and when I say about this, uh, when I talk about be careful of scams in Thailand, but I always mention, I say, look, give them the benefit of the doubt because they actually might be coming up to you to, to actually help you. They want to help you. Right. It might not be a scam. So don't just get angry with every single time. No, right, right. Give them right. the benefit of the doubt because sure. if you go to these places uh, in Pattaya, they get angry with you even before you open your mouth sometimes. And I, I find that hard when I go to these places. Why, why, why are they so angry with me? With me? And I, but if you go to a place where there's hardly any foreigners, they're really, really nice. They invite you back to your home and yes. you, you eat meals with them. I remember going to some festivals and particularly if you're, you're alone and you're traveling alone, they, they invite you to the front row with the VIP guests and you're out there eating at the VIP. Very VIP. great guy. Yeah, yeah. They, 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 they're very welcoming uh, kind of people. And you don't get that in, the, um, in, in places like Patia. And that's one of the reasons I loved it during covid because in COVID there wasn't any, there wasn't hardly any foreigners, right? The yeah. outside foreigners. So when you're traveling, they actually liked, they wanted to see you and they were happy to see you. <laughs> and, like, and, and were, tourist, it was back right? to the way it was right? like 20 years ago, where they were inviting you in and sharing meals, and 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 they were actually being very nice to you. <laughs> the, the last time I was in Krabi, I remember I was in a Burger King. Don't judge me. And uh, there was some big buff tribal tattoo Russian dude with his shirt off eating a burger. And oh, I was I was sort of waiting on the side for my order, and he walked up, and the, the cashier was like this twenty two year old girl, tiny little woman, and this guy opened his burger, and he said, "Is this a joke?" <laughs> you know, like how how can you not oh, oh get oh jaded God. and bitter dealing with that yeah. every day? Precisely, I, I and you him. can't blame them for the way they act in in the tourist destination. I think he was yeah. right. like his his patty was small or something. Oh, wow. But uh, quite often I'm kind of embarrassed to to be a foreigner kind of thing. Sometimes, yeah. Because it's like we're all grouped together. The the, the word farang is is all of us and we're grouped together. Yeah, and yeah. and that kind of a shame that I'm part of that. That's why that I, I think, I mean, ear, earlier you said you don't want to be an ambassador for foreigners. And Ed and I have argued about this on the show before. I think that we are all ambassadors. Every foreigner well, we in any country we should be. is an ambassador for yeah. all foreigners, fairly or unfairly. But if you do something bad or out of line and you get you know, displayed as, as, as a rude or ignorant person that's disruptive, it, 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 it follows on to the rest of us yes, fairly or unfairly. Absolutely. So it's just kind of unfortunate because ties are ties, but in Europe, there's so many different cultures and so many different ways of doing the same thing. One, one way is not right or one way is not wrong, Right. but we all group together just because he, they do that certain thing. We get. So it's like tie or not tie. Yes. That's, that's all precisely. Is, yeah. Oh, the, yeah. I mean, that's another thing altogether even though i've been here was it 28 29 years and even if i do one day apply for citizenship i will never be a thai i will always be that sure. for Lang. yeah exactly and you, you have to make a decision it's like are, are you happy with that are you always are you happy being always being the guest in this country and be on your best behavior and right stuff right like that. right so, right richard i was going to ask you uh obviously today you're kind of you're, you're somewhat famous for different things, and we'll, we'll get to the tweeting and that kind of stuff. But I, I think you're just well known as a very big traveler within Thailand. And I, I'm just curious, did you do that early on or did that come over time? 
No, right, right from the beginning. So, uh, so when when I was at school, when no, they were asking, you know, what 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 job do you want to do when you grow up?" And it was basically, well, my, I, I, there's two things I knew I didn't want to do. One was being a farmer, which is my father, <laughs> and the second one was be a teacher, which was my mother. <laughs> so there's two things I didn't want to do. But I was, I was really interested in photography and, and film, filmmaking as well. So I, I really wanted to go down that that road. So yeah, so I, so I, I, there's different ways to get into the industry. So I was either going to be a photojournalist. So I was thinking about okay, I apply for some newspapers, and then I was thinking, oh, I quite like filmmaking. I like making stories, sh- sharing stories with pictures. So being like a, a photojournalist. And then, then it was like filmmaking, which is similar because you're making a story, but with moving pictures. So I, I, I decided to go down the filmmaking uh, road. So I, I became a runner in a post-production company. So it was kind of random. That's the only job I managed to get. So I then entered the, uh, the, uh, the film editing room as an assistant film editor and then did uh, sound editing as well. And then I moved over to uh, the BBC. And I really enjoyed that. It was, it was kind of related to my dream. So then... Fast forwarding to here, I've always had an interest in travel, which is kind of escape, I guess, escape from sure, yeah. the family farm, shall we say, which <laughs> is what that would have been my future. <laughs> so it was like I came here. So almost almost straight away, I, I re- in the early days of the internet, and I think it was like 1996, 1997, I think that's when I, I started doing websites. And I, I, I think but it was 97. Tra- travel related. Travel-related websites. I yeah, think one of the like first pre-Napster. One of the one of the first uh, websites I actually bought was backnam.com and and th- uh, ones like that, and it was all to do with travel. So I was literally the first. What? No, no. One of the first travel bloggers before the word travel blogger became known. And and now you could say I'm, I'm the longest running one because most of those people have come and gone. And you they're, mostly they're wrote here. about do you, you you wrote about Travel. Bangkok or, uh, no, or Smutbrak Khan, no, no. but also Bangkok. Well, the first but also one, Backnam. dot com, was about uh, Smutbrak Khan. Backnam oh. is the the oh. city where I live. But then, yeah, I, I did other travel ones. I had a website called Thaiblogs. dot com, and uh, there's a guidebook website as well. So it was about travel in in, in the um, in the country. And I always wanted to do live blogging. But back then we had the dial-up thing where you have to, you know, the noise sure, you got. Sure. And, and so I couldn't do it during the day. I had to wait to get to the hostel or the hotel. And then we did this very slow dial-up. And then I tried to upload the the pictures. But I had to reduce the size of the pictures down to like 400 pixels or something. Because, oh, geez, yeah, because, because you know, the upload sure, sure. speed. And, and you couldn't have too many pictures on one page because no one could open that page if you had too many pictures. So basically... That was the closest I could get to being live that I was traveling. I had a, had a car, so I was traveling for like a couple of weeks during the summer holidays and I would upload pictures and I was doing it during the weekend. So we're talking about the 1990s, the late 1990s. And I, that's when I wow. started uh, travel blogging, even before it was called travel blogging. Did you have a digital camera? Did those? No, not to start around? with, it was, uh, but yeah, digital camera came quite early. So it was, that would have been around 98, 99, I think the first, di- they were kind of crap. They gave you 128K all those pictures. pictures all those yeah. pictures I would have thrown away by now for sure yeah yeah so i had to redo everything but yeah i started with uh, the regular steels camera and then you know had to scan it but then quickly uh, digital cameras right. appear so i was one of the first adoptees for, richard can i for ask that. you this i think another thing another characteristic of of all the material you put out is you don't seem to be trying to make money from what you're doing or at least not make a lot of money like there's there's no pressure to join this club uh, and i'm not saying you don't make any money at all i'm not sure but i'm curious from the from the beginning is that how it was or 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 back then were you did you have dreams of i'm gonna i'm gonna get rich doing this with this website well in those days it's a different environment it's not like today with youtube and 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 things like that where people become not quite instant millionaires but they, right. they, they you can, can you can go they viral can quite, right? like yeah like tiktok and stuff like that they can make money quite quickly and become uh, an influencer should we say we didn't have influencers right. uh back then so back then and even now fame and money never motivated me i i was doing it for the love of it so when i was saying before when i was at school i, I wanted to be a photojournalist that's exactly what i'm doing now i'm traveling taking pictures and making stories and that went from the website to what, what we call now microblogging, which is Twitter. 
Twitter is basically photos with extended captions. Sure, sure. So, so I, I've so going back to when I first started doing the blogs, and I was sort of live, uh, updating at the end of the day. To now, when I'm on trips, I'm literally live because every place I visit, I'm uploading the pictures and the extended captions from from the location. So, I guess in the future, I might have a a, a live webcam permanently on my sure. head, and people can actually <laughs> the barrel interact. cam. Interact, yeah, something like that. I can see that coming. People can interact and oh, turn turn your head to the left a bit, or it might be a three sixty so that I don't need to but, turn my but head. But in general, you're just doing all this because you like it. So you have no strategy. I, I, you have no, no business plan to I, make money. No, no, it never motivates. I, I have a salary from the school, and that was enough money to uh, uh, pay pay my way. And I, I live a simple life, and I don't have any ambitions kind of thing and i was li- like i said i was living inside the school for many years so i didn't have to pay for anything it was right. only when i moved out but i had saved a lot of money up and i was able to buy my house for cash so i don't have a mortgage so i don't have to pay rent oh, nice, nice. and and the electricity and water is very cheap so my my daily expenses is very and, and very low life in this province is probably cheaper yeah, than it is yeah in even though we're very close to bangkok the the living expenses here is very low so right, yeah. and i you know I, I i eat for free at school as well so i mean the daily expenses are extremely low it's funny it's funny isn't it and it's probably like a lot like uh, a lot of places too but let's just talk about bangkok but bangkok is not the cheap city it used to be it's expensive mm. but it can be quite cheap if you know how things work and how things fit together and where the cracks are. Well, if you want a Western lifestyle, then yes, it can be expensive. Like if I go to the supermarket and then I buy boxes of cereals or Dijon buy, mustard, uh, things, things, like, things that. like that, and then yeah, your 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 the bill is going to be really high. But then if I I can quite perfectly not go to. Uh, to the supermarket for two, three weeks uh, and then just buy stuff locally kind yeah, of thing. You right. can go to the market and just buy the fruit and vegetables that you need. And yeah, but yourself. I mean, like, if you so, want yeah. a coffee, you don't have to go to Starbucks. No. You know, if you no. want groceries... Well, we don't, don't have Starbucks around here, so... No, you're, so you're I, 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 so I have the Nescafe coffee, so don't, yeah, right. don't, don't, don't shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but things are changing. Even in Backnam, in here, we, we started to get our first air-conditioned restaurants, <laughs> and, and, and things are starting to go up market, shall we say, here. So uh, the, the, the prices will uh, go up. We, we started to get, as you saw from the, uh, the top of the tower, you, we got condos going up. So things are changing. We're becoming... We're merging more with Bangkok than before. How often do you go into Bangkok? Do you ever feel like you want to go to a nice air conditioned restaurant, or you want to you want to go to IMAX, or you want to go to Starbucks, or you just adapted to Samut Prakash? I, I never went in before. For many oh. years, people were asking me what was Bangkok like before. I had no idea. I never went. Oh wow! I, wow. Even though now it's oh, we're not that far away, but I hardly ever went into. Uh, and even Bangkok. now, you, you don't. And go then much? when no, not necessarily. Um, I might go in when there's an event or something I'm going to attend, or I want to do some exploring in a particular area, or there's a, a festival or something. But I don't do a regular thing. I'm working at the school, and, and you know, I, I don't always have the energy to go in and do something in Bangkok. But I'm, at the same time, I'm, I'm working on the website and, and doing stuff in the evening. So I'm working at the school during the day because that's my day job. And then in the evening, I'm working on the on the the websites, and particularly the the new ones. I'm working on the, with the trains. Yeah, I want to get to, into that in a little bit. But first, I just want to ask. I mean, at one point, didn't you have like fifty domains? You had like Thai lottery. Uh, yeah, there was, there was a lot. Thai jail and life and things like that. Thai prison life. Thai prison life. <laughs> <laughs> the um, I think the the reason was I, I started with the main website, and then it had like. When I when I got something that was really popular, or I was really interested in. I decided, okay, let's have a dedicated website just for that that thing. So I, I started doing that, but then it became harder. Like like I've had problems with like websites getting hacked or the servers getting hacked and and viruses and stuff. So instead of ma- spending time maintaining one or two websites, I had to do the same thing on like fifty websites, and it just became. Uh, a lot of work so i'm kind of streamlining i've dropped a lot of uh websites and then these days people don't want to read the long web blogs like they did in the, in the past and the, the 1000 2000 word they just want pictures with extended uh captions which is what twitter and and to an extent facebook is, right. is. but yeah I, I i still like the websites and i will still continue with the websites because social media comes and goes you don't put all your eggs in one basket what was before facebook it was MySpace. My, MySpace, yeah. I mean, it's like these things come and go. And there's been other, before uh, the, the the photo storage places or, you know, there's those come and go. And I've had my photos on one place 
and it was gray, and then they suddenly closed down, you lose everything. Like a photo bucket closed yeah, down. I had a like ton that. of photos yeah. on there. So it's kind of annoying when they do that kind of thing. And it's, it's always best to have your own domain, your own web space. Right. So I, all, I will always continue with that. As, as a personal aside, I remember back in the day, you uh, were doing stories on, there was a, a, a local high school kid that you had gotten to know, and yeah. he had a daughter. And he had spent time in prison. Mm. And then he wrote. He's there now. Again. He's back in prison. Okay. Yeah. Whatever happened to his daughter? Yeah. Well, she's. Uh, so she she came here. She was. I was teaching her. She was my student. And then she went to a secondary school. And she's now in university. Oh, great. So, yeah. Grace, right? Yeah, Grace. Right. Yeah. Great. So, okay. yeah, she's doing well. She speaks fluent English. And, and she's doing well in Japanese as well. Oh, fantastic. So she's doing really well for herself. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. So she was, she was kind of an uh, adopted daughter, but then she lived with her, her grandparents. But I was kind of supporting her through school. So, yeah. Right. That, cool. that was an ex-student. He was working with me, working on some of the websites. So I had a few, few of the ex-students, and they were working with me. Mm. But they all gone on to bigger and better things. <laughs> So uh, let's let's talk about Samut Prakan then before we get uh, into the into the Twitter and trains and everything. The, the Sky Train comes right through the middle of town now, almost to the middle of and town. And beyond. And beyond. It goes way down to the Gulf of Thailand. Well, not quite, but nearly. Almost. <laughs> and we were just up at the Observation Tower, which is actually, it's Ed and I were saying, it's really well done. It's very beautiful. And it gives you a, sure. a view of Bangkok, sort of back towards Bangkok that I've never seen. Everyone's been up to the top of State Tower and the Mahanakon right. Tower and stuff. And that view is all over the blogs and websites and stuff. But coming down here, it gives you a real unique view and perspective on the city um, that I've never seen. So Samut Prakan, is, is it becoming hip, cool? Uh, I wouldn't say it's becoming hip. <laughs> we, I mean, it's changing I mean, like from, from the observation deck, you can see all the condos which weren't there before. And, and like I said, with the, uh, the air-conditioned restaurants and stuff. So it, it is changing. We're, we're getting the Instagram coffee shops now and things like that. Right. So it is changing. But it's also, we're so close to Bangkok, but we're not Bangkok. So you, you, can, you can catch a sky train in less than one hour. You're down outside of Bangkok, and it's, it's a very different environment down here. So... Yeah, but we're we're starting to see like foreigners coming down here, walking around. Mm -hmm. But it's it's not like a fantastically beautiful. It's it's just another city. But it's a fishing. Well, it was a fishing village, but it's it's, it's a city with with a fishing harbor. So you can walk around. There's the fish market, the wet market. But there is no kind of upscale nightlife bar district. That's not here yet. There's a bar district, but it's not upscale. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, but it hasn't it's, got, it's, you know, it's kind of a brothel, should we say? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you know, it's like, for example, like Chinatown, you know, it was very old in Bangkok, but but then now there's like a strip of like like hip bars. No, no. And... That, that's, that hasn't come. Oh, yeah. okay. I, I guess it will because the SkyTrain changes everything. And the SkyTrain is going through the town and beyond now, it will go down to the Gulf of Thailand. So people from Bangkok will be able to go down to the sea right. maybe in five are, are years. You, are you happy about the SkyTrain or are you just like, oh my God, here we go. I was really looking go. forward to having the SkyTrain here and I thought this, and now I can get into Bangkok quicker and easier. But I, I don't really take it that much into to Bangkok, apart from the 10 minute walk to the station, which is way too long. <laughs> <laughs> the It's actually, uh, it's not always convenient. And it's actually, because I have a car and it's actually quicker for me for example, if I go to Central World or something, that's one hour door to door. And then if I want to go somewhere else, it is then a bit longer. But if I want to go by car and I kind of go in the back way outside of uh, Russia, it could take me 35 minutes to get into Central Bangkok. Oh, wow. So, And if I'm going to buy something or whatever, you know, if I go to the book fair, you, you don't want to come back carrying all these heavy bags on the sky train right. so gotcha. i'm i'm actually still using the car and i shouldn't really but i am gotcha <laughs> right so let's 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 dive into uh your online presence then which a lot a lot of people know you about um well a lot of people i mean because there's there's waves shall we say and, lo and during covid a lot of people thought i just appeared during covid but there's been other occasions like COVID before. We we had the the political protests. We had the yellow shirts. We had the red shirts, and then we had incidents like the Racha Prasong uh, bombing at the Erlewan One Shrine, yeah. and Mother's Day bombing a number of places down south and around the country. There was bombs going off. So every time there's kind of a, a crisis, I'm kind of there, not quite reporting, but I'm giving the information that people need, and that's. That's basically how it how it started. So my my first presence on the internet was the small websites, right? Yeah, and then when social media 
uh, when was it? 20, 2010. Yeah, so 2010, that's when I bought my first iPhone. Okay. Or my first smartphone. Okay. Uh, we're not allowed to advertise. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> so my first smartphone was an iPhone. <laughs> yeah. And basically, I, I had uh, signed up for Twitter the year before, but was Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Just... And, then, and then I bought my smart, first smartphone. And then I was able for the first time to do what I wanted to do, which was travel and, and post live on, on, on Twitter. Yeah. The pictures were a bit crap because, you know, the dial up and all things like that. It was, but it, it was, that was the beginning. And then that was like February 2010. And then March 2010, the red shirts in Simbabrakan marched into Bangkok, and that was the the start of one, one of the big uh, protests in, in Bangkok. And no one knew what was going on, particularly the foreigners, because there was no information in English. the The Nation and the Bangkok Post were around, but nothing was being posted live, yeah, like there is now. And then there was no English language media, hardly, hardly any English language uh, media posting live. They they would do l updates later in the day, and there were some Thai media people posting stuff, but they were very vague and they weren't given the details that we really wanted. So I, I started by like translating what the Thais were saying and then posting that on my Twitter feed. And then, then I got frustrated because they were talking about this bomb or this whatever, this march and closing roads. And they'd never actually said the name of the road. They said the district. And it wasn't very useful information. So then it, it, I ended up having to go to these places and I was mapping these places and I, I did a Google map called uh, uh, Bangkok Dangerous because there was a number of explosions yes, around, around Bangkok. Yeah. And, and that ended up having like over a million visits and it was it was mentioned on CNN a, f a few times as well. So basically I was filling a void, shall we say. No one else was doing it at that time. There was no information coming out live and, and I, I was the only one doing it at that time. And that's why- So in a way you're, so yeah, right, you're becoming now a journalist, which. You know. but, but back then we were calling it, it was a new term. It was like citizen journalist. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Which was what I was fine with. And you embraced it though. Yes, because I was going out there on my bicycle and, and I was kind of reporting, but not reporting. <laughs> I was showing it from, I was trying to stay neutral and I was every tweet, I always tried to have a picture. So I let the picture tell the right. story. So I always tried to have a, like a wide angle picture. Right, and so, yeah. so I don't have to say there was 500 people or let the picture tell you that it was a big crowd or a small crowd right. kind of thing. And I always did that. And I, I remember the year after that, it was the, the big flood of Bangkok. And there was a lot of stuff in the, in the, in the media about Bangkok was underwater and it's the biblical yeah, floods. Yeah, I remember this. And, the, uh, and, and the, they, they showed pictures of the uh, Dongmung Airport and these, these planes were deep in the water kind of thing. Oh, I remember that. It was, it was kind of... Uh, misleading and it wasn't really like that it wasn't the whole of bangkok it was isolated areas and, and i was kind of frustrated that all these tourists were also uh uh canceling holidays because they thought the airport was closed and the whole of it, bangkok was underwater so i i came up with this uh hashtag no flood here mm -hmm. and i went out on my bicycle and i just said i took a picture no flood here took a picture no flood. i went to like all the and i went to the grand palace and then there was like a there was a kind of a two inches should I say I remember I remember this tweet and it it was a high tide flood oh right it wasn't a flood flood it was a high tide flood and oh, we right. get this here in back now even when it doesn't rain we get high tide floods for like an hour or two and then it goes down so right. it's basically water waiting to drain yeah and and where, when I was there I, I saw this uh, media crew international media crew and and the guy was in his his Wellington boots standing in the deepest puddle he could find and it was dry on either side. Oh, I see. And the yeah. camera was down low to make it look like it stretched all the way to, the backdrop was the Grand Palace. Oh, but right. that was the iconic shot. That's what they wanted for the, that's, that's the, the money, you know, what they'll sell the, the story. Get the so, quicks, so, 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 say, I, yeah. so I took a picture of that, the camera's angle, and then I took the wide angle as well. And I said, this, uh -huh. this is kind of yeah. typical, and this is the kind of mis, misinformation that's been put out there. And like 10 but, meters away, there's people walking yeah, down the yeah, sidewalk. Yeah, it was perfectly dry. fine. And right. like I said, it was a high tide flood anyway, and it was going down. And that was, that was so typical of the time. And it was the same with the, uh, during the protests. And the media were given the impression that the whole of uh, uh, Bangkok was uh, dangerous. And it wasn't. It was isolated areas like sure. the Ratcha Prasong uh, intersection. Yeah. And, and there was, the rest of Bangkok was perfectly fine. Business and that's what I tried usual. to do. And that's why I was trying to do with the maps and things like that. And I remember there was another 
I think it was CNN, yeah, CNN, CNN during the flood, and they they came out and said, oh, the uh, the, the airport, the Bangkok, uh, Bangkok's Thailand's main airport has been closed because uh, because of flooding. So I, I, I immediately tweeted and I said uh, the picture they were showing was these uh, decommissioned airplanes at Don Muang Airport, and at that time that was just a minor airport, the main airport, the so Wan Airport was open, fully operational. It has this massive flood wall around it and have uh, drainage canals. It sure. was perfectly safe. There was no, no danger of it being uh, flooded. So I tweeted out and said, said this. And within 30 minutes, I, I saw on CNN, they just retracted the story and said, we, right. we just heard that. Uh, the, oh, the, the yeah, yeah. So that, that kind of showed me quite early on the power of, of uh, social media and Twitter. And that, that was in, what, 19, I don't know. 98 or something. Uh, no, so, no, 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 2012. Something right. like that. Yeah. yeah. Listeners, uh, um, some of you will know this, uh, you know, if, you've, uh, if you're an expat, but uh, I, I just want to make sure it's clear, like the, the impact that Richard has had over the years, because uh, I distinctly remember in 2010, 2011, all the things he's talking about, that Richard Barrow became my main news source. I just realized that if I wanted to know what was going on in Thailand, I checked Barrow. Greg obviously knows this, and obviously a lot of expats know this, but for our, all of our listeners around the world, it's like, basically, Richard became our CNN. Like, that's how, honestly, I checked, I checked him every single day, like through, through the protests, through the floods, exactly what you're talking about. I just came to think of what he said as more reliable than either the Thai news, which was either in Thai language or was political or whatever. And then like CNN, like you said, they're, they're either over-dramatizing something or they have late information. And he, he, he became the major news source, yeah. I think, for, for a decade. But I, I knew nothing about that. At the time, for the first year or so, I had no idea the number of people that were following it and finding it useful. And I, I found out later that like embassies or, or um, oh, for you know, sure. and uh, hotel no. managers, they were doing these daily briefings based on my tweets. And, I, I had sure. no, and luckily, I didn't know because they <laughs> that so much pressure <laughs> to get everything right. But the, the, yeah, no, I, I, thought, I found that I out later. Were, I mean, that. I didn't know anything about you. I thought you were like a professional, like maybe. Well, that's the thing. And, and you know, I thought you were like an ex former BBC journalist, or I thought you were like. I thought well, you people were think there's journal. like a whole team as right, well, and right, it's right. like I had uh, AP. Uh, I think it was AP or Reuters. They, they contacted me and said, "Look, can we uh, send a camera crew? We want to follow you around doing doing your, your your typical day covering the protests and." I said, no, because yeah. that's, I mean, at that time, I think you were around the time you were trying to get me to do interviews and I was being very strict. I didn't want that high profile and I, I didn't want to do interviews. So I kept tweeting out that I don't do interviews and, and yeah. I, I've, this is actually, you got an exclusive here. This is actually my first, <laughs> nice. my it's very first, uh, first interview. interview. Ever. Not, not ever, right in the early days when I was doing the school internet projects with my students. We, the Bank of Post were doing some stuff, but that was mainly focused on the, the students. I was always pushing the students in, in the forefront. But yeah, I, I always shy away from doing interviews. I, I, I don't want to be in the limelight. Uh, I, I, don't, I want the story to be the story and not me kind of thing. And that kind of models it. You see these, uh, these days there's a lot of people doing what I, I, I'm doing. So now I have a lot more competition, but we do it in different styles. They're, they're, they're very much forefront, as in they're quite often they are the story. Well, I don't want that to be... I'm not sure there's many people doing what you're doing. I mean, they're, But they're, they're, they're professional media people now sure. who are actually, back in the day, they wouldn't be doing tweeting on the side. They would be busy writing the story, and then the next day they will publish the story. But now you will get them... Uh, tw uh, tweeting uh, live from the protest. Right. But quite often you will see, even though it's nice that we have more more people doing it and we see more viewpoints, but quite often they're being like sarcastic or, or they're kind of very biased. And all the time I try to stay stay neutral, stay on the fence. But what, what is interesting, during the red shirt, red shirt protest, I was accused of being a yellow shirt supporter. And then during the yellow shirt protest, I was accused of being a red shirt. Yeah, protest sure. and i kept saying no no I, i'm on I, i'm on, on i'm on the uh on the fence um I, i'm sure. not choosing sides it's not my place to say one or the other and then someone said oh you shouldn't be on the fence you need to choose a side right like, <laughs> yeah, i mean no you can idea. never win and that's that's been the story of my life I, i've realized quite quickly I, I can never win any of these arguments and back then it was the red shirt yellow shirt became very political and a lot of, right. lot of foreigners got angry about 
one or the other, and then became COVID and the vaccine. I don't know why foreigners and the mask. I I don't know why foreigners do this, but when there's things like this, they always jump in and whatever I say, even if I don't mean it, like they think I mean it, they will twist it and they have their their kind of their agenda and they just push their agenda onto onto me. It's it's. I I want to come back to that in more detail in a little bit, but it's funny that 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 sort of the 2010 ish incidents with the red shirts was your sort of right place at the right time because yeah, not, exactly, to, not yeah. to take anything i wasn't necessarily the best person i was just the only one there yes and, and not to take anything away from what you do but i think probably many people could have done that if yes. they were there and yeah that, exactly yeah but i just felt I, I saw there was a need and i filled that gap yeah. and that's funny because that's exactly how this podcast started because tony the season one co-host tony joe he was down at the Kokwu intersection when it all kicked off the mm. one night. And he had a website back then called Thai FAQ. And he was filming a video and he's like, hey, everyone, just let you know what's going on. Here I am down at the end of protests. And it doesn't seem to be much going on. And then suddenly, bang, 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 bang. And suddenly there was tear gas and helicopters and Tony's ducking behind the sandbags. And he's got, wait, you know, wait, Was this a video or audio? This is all on video. This is what Tony shot. And for like... For like a week, Tony was the number one guy. Like this was all over the place. You probably retweeted it at the time. Yeah, yeah. And that's how I met Tony because I was having a, a one of my epic parties at my my old Chinatown pad. Eddie, you remember those? Sure. And I, I reached out to Tony and I was like, hey, you want to come by? It'd be great to talk about this cool video you did. And he was like, sure. So he came by to my place and we met and we both decided that, hey, we, have, we both want to do a podcast. Let's do it together. And that was the birth of, mm. of this podcast. Yeah, I remember. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was the precise beginning. Yeah, yeah, the same thing. I got to say, man, I had a lot of fun doing this interview. Um, I mean, you, you had met him, of course, over the years, but I had never met him. Uh, but as I say in the interview, he was my CNN. You know, during the floods, during the coups, and um, so I've just I, I've, I've I must have read thousands and thousands of his tweets. Like he he's a big part of my Thai experience. He really is, especially if you're if you're slightly nerdy, slightly only like you and I, and spend a lot of our time online, um, and especially in a place like Thailand. Again, we talk about this in the in the interview, but you know where where, where things sometimes go a little bit pear shaped, and you need to know what's happening on the ground as it happens. That's right. Um, you know what the service that Richard does is invaluable, and back in the day, there wasn't many people doing that. But, you know, now there's a lot more people doing what Richard does, but he was the original back in the early days of Twitter. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I've known him for a long time. We used to go on bike rides together a long time ago, back when he had more free time, when he wasn't tweeting so much. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, he's always been a friend, a really cool guy, and it was so nice to actually sit down and chat with him. And he, he was very generous and gave us a lot of his time. Well, to be honest, in person, he, he just comes across as a very regular guy. Like, he just is what he appears to be. Right. And I think, uh, you know, as we talked about in the interview, uh, I think mo- mo- I think mostly we got to it in part two, but um, it seems like people online are always looking for some backstory or some secret thing or some ulterior motive, yeah. you know, and, and, you know, if you just follow his tweets, it's just very straightforward news. He does g- give his opinion on stuff, but usually lets you know if it's his his take. And he does he does tweet about personal stuff sometimes, like here's what I had for lunch. But it's all just done in a very straightforward way. But he just does it so much, and it's so useful that it's like people can't fathom that <laughs> he that he's not getting paid by someone. Like everyone is looking for the secret angle. Like what's the angle, man? And and no matter what he says, people just don't believe don't believe right. he is he is who he appears to be. Right. And then, every, and then, every- so I was just curious to meet him, like, and and but he actually just is a totally. I mean, I, Richard, you're probably going to listen to this. I don't mean this is an insult in any way, but you just he does come across as just a totally regular guy, doesn't he? Like <laughs> he just like a nice, normal guy. That's right. his, that's that's just who he is. Everyone's got an agenda to push now. Like no one tweets that much about trains unless they're being paid by the state railway of Thailand. No right. one says this about hotels this often unless they're being paid by hotels. Like, yeah, or like they, you know, it's just it. it they just can't but, get it get get it through their head that like you know he was just there when this audience was being built and he was the first one to get it following and he's just tweets about the stuff that he likes. That's it. That's it. I was uh, chatting about this with uh, my buddy Jim, who is visiting Thailand, who I talked about on the bonus show. And my buddy Jim is a saxophone player. And uh, 
we realized that like Richard, in a way, he's kind of like a musician where, you know, obviously there are professional musicians who get paid and can make a living. But, you know, just a huge number of musicians are mostly playing just because they love playing. I mean, they might get paid here and there. Um, but the bottom line is that they're playing music because they love playing music. And but people accept that. Like no, no one, no one questions that. But when a guy just likes to tweet um, factual information, so essentially he's he's like a citizen journalist. Like he's just he's just using his free time to do journalism, really. But right. but they're, 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 like people can't process that the way they can process a musician who's just playing for fun. Like he's just doing this because he loves doing it. That's it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we sometimes get criticism or messages from people, hey, you should do this or hey, you should stop doing this or, you know, I, I you know, you guys are hypocrites because this, this and this. And my response is always what what Richard seems to say, too, is like, hey, man, making a podcast is absolutely free, costs zero dollars. Just go right ahead and start it up. I'll be your first subscriber. Go nuts. That's you know, right. You yeah. don't have to follow me if you don't want to. I'm just doing what we do because we like doing it. Well, um, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure he's the kind of guy who's going to come back on regularly, but he's way more than welcome. Like he's, he's just up there among the, the, the Yodas, you know, we now, we, we have to make a list. Uh, I don't know what, whether we want to call them black belts or red belts or, but now we, we have now interviewed several of these like Jedi masters on Thailand. Like they just, they just dwarf our knowledge, like the knowledge that we have, you know, together you and I have more than 40 years of knowledge, but I feel that we're dwarfed by, by a couple Titans and Richard's definitely in that, in that category. Right. They call it the Barrow exponent. So it's right. like, <laughs> right. well, he's just been everywhere. I mean, he, he, it's not just that he, he, he follows news. It's that he travels all over Thailand. Right. And so he's just been everywhere and he can just speak about this village, this small town. And b because he's been, essentially working as a journalist, he just kind of knows every event, every activity, every person. Um, it's just, it's just fascinating. And, uh, you guys will, uh, I'm sure listeners, you hopefully you enjoyed that part one and part, but in part two, we get into a little bit more of, of the controversy that people kind of drum up. Like there actually is no controversy, but, but it, you know, it's like people, <laughs> people like, you know, I think one time you referred to him as controversial, but, the, but that's the irony of the whole thing. Is that he, right. he doesn't actually he doesn't really do anything controversial, but the, like people generate controversy like around him. That's what he said, right? He's like they put all this stuff and they elevate me to this this level that I have no business being at. Like I don't belong here. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Thanks a lot, Richard. Uh, that was really cool. And I, I I did mention at the beginning, but I for some reason Ed, when we did the recording, I cut off the first like four or five minutes of my interview, so I the interview is missing the the official welcome, but uh, oh yeah, shit, the rest the rest of it worked out well. But yeah, thanks, Richard. It was a pleasure to sit down. Thanks again. It only took 13 years. So maybe in another That's 13, right. you can come on again. Hopefully. Yeah, and long. maybe he'll come on just in, in just 10 more years. <laughs> yeah, baby steps, baby steps. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Thanks, Richard. All right, let's get into some love, loathe, or live with, where one of us picks a particular aspect of living in Bangkok, which we then discuss to decide if it's something we love about living here, loathe about living here, or have come to accept as just something that we have to live with no matter how we feel about it. Now, last week, I asked Ed what he thought about those little effervescent vitamin C tablets that a lot of Thai people will tell you is the cure for all diseases. So this week, Ed, <laughs> why don't you ask me something? All right, I got a very straightforward thing. Uh, we've obviously talked about this in general, but I'm, I want to get more your personal reaction. All right. Walking around the streets of Bangkok. Yeah, I'm down. Love, loathe, or live with weed, cannabis, the new Thai cannabis culture. Shops everywhere, a fair number of people smoking outside, maybe people even smoking in bars, even though you're not a, much of a bar hopper anymore. Personally, what's your take on it? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I'm I'm real conflicted about it. I I've never smoked. I've never tried weed. I think smoking is one of the most disgusting habits. You mean smoking in general? Smoking tobacco? You mean smoking tobacco is just oh, ugh, so gross. Sorry for any listeners out there who smoke, but ugh. um, and I I hate it. But I'm outside. Like where where are they supposed to go? So in the last so roughly, weed's been legal now for six seven months, something like that. Yeah. Um, but so you can't remember. So you've never been particularly bothered by it. So you've never, let's say, been standing outside at the ATM and, and weed smoke comes wafting over. Yeah. Have, have yeah, you experienced I, that? I, 
I, I've smelled it, yeah, and I don't like it. I think it stinks. It, sm- it smells like when my dog got sprayed by a skunk when I was a kid, and we had to, <laughs> we had to give her a bath with tomato juice to get the stank off of her. It, it's it's gross. It's unpleasant and it stinks. But I'm outside. It usually doesn't last for more than a than you know half a second. Oh. So while I don't like it, I, it, I I have to just say live with because, you know. I'm, I'm outside. I think I think it's sort of fair game, um, and it doesn't really unless I'm standing right next to someone, then I can just move. But right. getting a, getting the odd whiff of it, yeah, I think it's a live with for me. All right, that sounds like it's a it's getting your it's, it sounds like a live with getting close to loathe to be honest. But uh, maybe maybe it ha- maybe you just haven't had the really bad experience yet. You know, if I, I mean, if I, I was inside, it would be loathe. But since I'm outside and the wind is blowing, it's just right, a right. With. Well, here's the truth. I want to say love. Um, you know, because I love that cannabis is legal, and uh, just just the just people being free to make their own choices about their personal life. I like this. Um, and I do like that there are shops, you know, around and there's a lot of options available. So I like that a lot. But the, the weird thing of my experience is I'm just, I'm starting to get a little bit annoyed by how many shops there are. Like I, I just walked down Kaosan Road today. There's got to be 30 shops on, on Kaosan alone. And it's oh, just yeah. every, I mean, I don't know why it would annoy me. It's just, uh, and I know the market will kind of solve these problems and there won't be so many. Um, weed smoke, I've never thought it smelled bad. I kind of like the smell. So I'm, I'm definitely, uh, I, I'm, probably, I'm probably a love I, that I like this new cannabis world. But, the, but okay. to be honest, it's like, it, I feel like it's getting a little bit too much. Like there's just, I just feel like I'm seeing just weed shops everywhere. And I don't know. It, it, it would be like if I, if I saw like out, places selling alcohol, like at, all over the place. It would just be weird. Like liquor stores, like liquor store here, liquor store here, liquor store there. It I would be pretty, so. It would be kind of weird. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say I, I'm a love. I have to like officially say love. Um, but it, it does seem like it's just getting a little bit overbearing. Like it's, just, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's almost like omnipresent now. Yeah, I, I, I can see that. And, and someone on our, our Discord server, when we were chatting with our patrons on Discord, they were mentioning like, there's weed shops everywhere, but I've never seen one busy. Oh, interesting. And I was like, hmm, well, well, okay, the market. Yeah. Well, the market should solve that problem. That's um, what I was going mean, to say. Were, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I was in a. Yeah. I mean, they're rarely um, super busy, but you know, the what, the ones I go into, there's definitely customers in there. It see, it, it would be, it'll be surprise. It, there's no way all the ones that exist now are going to survive. But I, I personally, I wouldn't say they're empty. But yeah, I know what they mean. Uh, it's just they're 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 not slammed. That's for sure. Let the market decide. But yeah, I, I think can. I'm gonna live with on that one. Okay. I'm a love, but not not a super love that you might expect. <laughs> All right, so we're sort of like uh, we're a few steps away from each other on opposite ends of the scale, but close. That's right. That's right. Yeah. All right. A final thanks to our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website and connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, BangkokPodcast.com on the web, or simply Bangkok Podcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Yeah, baby. You can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us a voicemail through our website that we'll feature on the show. I got off of Twitter, but you can now find me on Mastodon at bkkgregathome.social. So thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll see you back here next week. For sure.